Okay, so I'm going to be teaching on praying before you eat. And what kicked this off is I was visiting some friends and they had put this delicious meal on the table and one of my friends prayed this prayer. Bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts that we are about to receive through thy bounty in Christ our Lord. Amen. And I'd heard this prayer lots of times as a kid growing up. And I, it really has kind of a sweetness to it when you think about it. If you break it down, bless us, O Lord. Like we're asking God for a blessing that all through the Old Testament, he was coaching Israel, come to me, come to me. And sure enough, that's what this prayer starts out doing. In these thy gifts, 1 Corinthians 1026 says, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, which also is in Psalms and I believe close to it in Haggai, that everything belongs to God and that, um, that when we have food in front of us, really ultimately God is the source of this. That we're about to receive, yeah, there was a table full of food, so I don't really have to <laughs> say too much more about what my intent is. Through thy, thy bounty. So bounty is like richness, like how rich is God? The more that you have, the more that you can give. How great our God is for all he gives to us. And then through Christ our Lord, amen. Every time we address God, it's because Jesus paved the way. And that, you know, everything that we have is through Christ. And I realized that with my friends, this was a habit that if they were very comfortable with it. They didn't have to think about it, they just did it. And it really made me notice that it wasn't a habit in my life. And that I felt sort of like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> it seems like a good thing to do and I'm not doing it. So I thought I would dig deep into praying before you eat. And I thought maybe this will inspire me to remember and do it more. So that's, that's how I got started um, with that. So one of the first places I went is I started looking at Jesus feeding the multitudes because I could remember him praying there. So the first record is in Mark 8, and we'll start in verse 6, and it says, And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before them, and they set them before the multitude. So he, he gave thanks for this bread, and then he broke it. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he set, said to set these before them as well. And they ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets. Now about 4,000 people were there, and he sent them away. This um, same record about the 4,000 is also covered in Matthew 15. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish, and he gave thanks and broke them and gave to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. And they all ate and were filled, and they took up what remained of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full, and those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. Then there was another event where he fed 5,000, and that's in John 6, records that. Jesus said, have the people recline to eat. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men reclined to eat, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who had reclined to eat, likewise also with the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the broken pieces that are left over, so that nothing is lost. So they gathered them up, and from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets with broken pieces. So, but all that was said was that he gave thanks or that he blessed. And these were a couple of pretty remarkable miracles. And so I wasn't quite sure, you know, if this anchored me to something that would help me remember every single day, every time I eat to pray. So I kept on going. Um, I thought about the record about the men on the road to Emmaus. And so that one is in Luke 24. And it starts in verse 13, or I'm going to start in verse 13. And look, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. 
And it came to pass while they were talking and discussing with one another that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were being prevented from recognizing him. I still, you know, it really doesn't give information about why or how their eyes were being prevented. Just that's all it says. Jesus was listening to their account of what happened to him. So then I'm jumping ahead to verse 28. And they drew near to the village where they were going, and he acted as if he was going further. And they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, because it's towards evening, and the day is now far spent. And he went in to stay with them. And it came to pass, when he had reclined to eat with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight. So it doesn't really say how their eyes were opened other than that they recognized him and that, you know, he was breaking the bread and blessing it prior to that. And I don't know if they were in the group of the 4,000 or the group of the 5,000. And I don't even really 100% know if it was only his 12 apostles at the Last Supper. Could there have been a couple of other people that, you know, were there too? I don't know, you know, but... Um, I, I wondered, you know, was was this a habit with Jesus every time he ate? There's just not enough information in the scripture to say if he did it all the time. And in the Old Testament, it's not really clear, you know, that there's records of people doing it, even with Elijah and the widow woman that with the, where, you know, she didn't have enough oil or bread to flour to feed her and her son. And Elijah said, you know, make a cake for me and you'll never run out. And that's exactly what happened. Um, but I, there wasn't really any record documentation of praying there. And so, you know, I'm still digging into this to try and see where's the pattern and what's the trigger and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so then I started looking at the Last Supper. I thought, okay, well, that's, that's got to be part of it. And so in Matthew 26, 26, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and having blessed it, he broke it, and giving it to the disciples said, Take, eat, this is my body. And having taken a cup, and having given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I say to you, I will absolutely not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So notice the covenant language in here. I'm going to defer to Doug a little because I'm sure that he's going to be covering this coming up and I don't want to steal his thunder or anything like that. I'm sure he'll have lots more to say about it. But just the same, you know, it really, you know, triggered it for me that this blessing of the cup was really tied to the covenant. It wasn't necessarily just like, you know, this is a regular thing I do every day. It's like I'm ushering in a new covenant here. It seemed kind of special. Um, but it did mention the forgiveness of sins, which I thought was like, hmm, that's, that's something that's, you know, important for me because sin sucks. And I kind of like the idea that, um, there's going to be a time when I get to be shook free completely from that stuff. That'll be good. In Mark 14, uh, it covers the record and it says, and while they were eating, he took bread and he, when he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will absolutely not drink from the fruit of the vine anymore until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So the covenant language also is here in Mark. But in the gospel where the overtones, this is in the gospel where the overtones of Jesus as the servant in the gospel of Mark, that you see that, the forgiveness of sins isn't mentioned there, where in Matthew, where it has more language of Christ as a king, that's, it is in there. Um, then in Luke, where the gospel carries the overtones of Jesus as a man, it contains the wording, do this in remembrance. So the, the connection with people, he adds that part to it. So Luke twenty two seventeen, 17, and he took a cup, 
And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will absolutely not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they ate saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So this covenant language exists in Luke also. Um, by the way, there's, there are two references in the epistles that, you know, carry some of this language. One of them's in 1 Corinthians 10, and starting in verse 16, it says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So it seems like, you know, by the first century church that they had recognized that that was a significant event and that they were, you know, imitating it to some extent. They were having kind of a ceremony with it. They were, you know, doing something about it. There was some intent with it that, that it would have got carried into the point where Paul is recognizing and Paul also says, because there is one loaf of bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And that um, this kind of reminds me of the part where Jesus says that he's the bread of life, that he relates himself to being the bread, that, you know, with the manna in the desert, and that he's our bread, you know, today that gives life. So... Um, he, and he continues, Paul talks, continues talking about food, you know, sacrificed to idols and not engaging in anything like that, that, you know, it, it, a lot of it has to do with where you're at and that you don't want your heart to get caught up in something that has to do with idols. So don't get engaged in that. Make sure that your heart is right where this stuff. And then in Corinthians, first Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, he, he goes back to this topic. Um, and he starts talking about how people are when they, in, when they assemble and emphasizes doing it as part of the one body. So in verse uh, 19 of 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For there must be also factions among you, so that the approved ones among you become recognized. When therefore you assemble together, is it not the Lord's supper you eat? For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? So it's kind of sarcastic here. Or do you look down on the church of God and put to shame those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you in this? I praise you not. So here he's kind of like coaching them and telling them, you know, don't, don't do this wrong. Do this right. Have the right heart. It's one body. You're all important here. Don't put yourself in front of somebody else. Make sure that all of you are recognized. This is a level playing field. You know, we need to reverence each other because all of us just make up part of this same loaf of bread. Yes. Um, so then he brings them back in and he says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he also took the cup saying, this is the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Then jumping down, well, okay, yeah, verse 27. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a person examine himself, and only in this way let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not discern the body. For this cause, many among you are weak and sick, and many sleep in death. But if we were examining ourselves, we would not be, judged, be being judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you meet together, it will not result in judgment. 
So uh, again, he reels him back in and brings him to this point of, you know, relative equality. We all have different parts in the body, but we are all parts of one body and that all of us are important and all of us need to be recognized and no one should put themselves ahead of anyone else. We're encouraged so many times to put others first before ourselves and that he really wants the believers to fellowship with each other and eat together, but to have the right heart, you know, when they're doing it. Um, so then I continued to look for more records about eating and praying. And I came to, you know, in the book of Acts, when Paul was at sea and there was the big storm. So Acts 27 in verse 33, it says, and as the day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food saying, today is the 14th day that you've continued in suspense and without food having taken nothing. nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food for this is for your safety. For not one of you will lose a hair from your head. And when he had said this, he had taken bread. He gave thanks to God in the presence of them all, and he broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and took food for themselves. And we were in all 276 souls in the ship. So he set that example, you know, in front of all of those people. Again, you know, he was really needing God's help, and God was delivering it. He was really thankful for it. So I'm going to jump back now to the Last Supper again. The only gospel I didn't cover was the Gospel of John. And interestingly enough, John is the only gospel that didn't mention the covenant. But it doesn't mention much of the meal at all. Just that he got up from the supper and washed the apostles' feet. Then he reclined again to eat. Then after some more teachings said, get up, let's go from here. But spending time in John caused me to see scriptures that spoke to me in the context of the emotion of knowing that his time with his disciples on earth was coming to a close. So going back to the context of the night, it's like he realized this is the last time I get to spend with these people. And that after that, you know, we're going to be parting ways on this earth and they're not going to have me there to help them. And I have to make this count. I almost sensed like, you know, this real, not, not really, uh, I don't know about desperation, but, you know, just so emotional, so wanting to connect, so wanting them to get it, so wanting them to really anchor on this because it was going to matter. He couldn't come back and rework this time that this had to be it. So I started, as I was going through these scriptures, and there were so many of them. I mean, I could have read all of John 17 where he has his prayer in there. It's like, oh my gosh. But, you know, but this is during the teachings that he has with them. This is some of the things that he's saying to them. In John 13, 1, now before the, so this is where he kind of gets started. Now before the feast of the Passover, which is kind of how the other ones start out too, Jesus knowing that his hour had come to depart out of this world to his father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This kind of like sets the context for what's going on, that this is, this is the, what's going on in the root of him for all of this stuff that's going on, is his love for them. John 13, 19. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it comes to pass, you will believe that I am he. He really wanted to make sure that they're going to, you know, not be unclear, that they're not going to have any reason to doubt, that he's giving them enough information to be sure that they're sure that he really is the Messiah. And you're gonna see that that similar language comes up again, almost like a bookend, you know, that that he makes this statement more than once. John 13, 33, little children, I am with you only a little while longer. You will seek me, and I as as I said to the Jews, now I say to you also, where I go, you are not able to come. John 14, 1, do not let your heart be troubled. Continue to trust in God and continue to trust in me. I, I'm starting to notice, you know, in some of these that 
he really has this concern of, you know, wanting to, to, you know, shoulder them up when he can't be there to shoulder them up, to let them know that there's words of encouragement, that there's, you know, words that can help build them up even when he's gone just by being able to remember that he said them. In John 14, 6, he said, Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this is such a strong statement. And in this context, you know, I'm so glad he made it here that, you know, to really anchor it in them. And it should be anchored in us too. There's so many people that say, well, I'm a good person. And you go, wow, that's interesting. Because he's even Jesus said, you know, am I good? Only God is good. <laughs> And yet there's people on the earth that say they're good, and yet I don't know their entire life. How can I, you know, dispute it? I wouldn't. But just the same, um, it kind of doesn't matter, good or not. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it's like, I, there's so many times that, you know, I want to sway that conversation and get people to realize that, whatever good or not good it's okay come as you it's a come as you are party you know but come through jesus and that no one comes to the father except through him and if you do come through him that you're going to be accepted in john 14 7 if you had known me you would have known my father also from now on you know him and have seen him that he's you know bridging really bridging that relationship between um, God and, and his followers. In John 14, verse 13 and 14, it says, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do so that the Father is glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And there's times that I've been praying that I get a little confused. Do I pray to Jesus or do I pray to God? And I know that I'm supposed to pray in Jesus' name. And if I'm praying to God, that makes sense. But if I'm praying to Jesus, do I pray in his name? I guess so, <laughs> according to this verse. So whether it seems awkward or not, that it's a-okay, that that's, that's what he's instructing him to do. In John 14, 19, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. What encouragement, you know, they would have, they would have been clearer about, you know, that there's a resurrection and that because I live, you'll live also that he's, he's kind of like setting the, the foreshadowing, you know, what they can expect. In John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be trouble, troubled, neither let it be afraid. What a comfort. For the things that are about to go on, if my head could drift back and have heard these words from him, that that would be very comforting and very encouraging. John 14, 29. And now I have told you before it comes to pass, so that when it comes to pass, you will believe. Kind of like what I said earlier, that it sort of bookends it. You know, I'm letting you know, remember these things. Um, John 15, 9, just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Live in my love. The first time I read that with respect to this teaching, it gave me goosebumps. Um, after that, it still did that just as the Father loved me, can you imagine how much God loved Jesus Christ? Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Wow. If you ever wonder if Jesus loves you, just go there. There's a good place for it. In John 15, 13, no one has greater love than this, that they would lay down his life for their friends. I know people that you know, have put a significant amount of their life, have camped out in the service of others to pour themselves out for someone else. And that's a great love. It's, it's something that when you see it, when you hear about it, you can't, you know, disregard it. It means something. It really means a lot. Jesus took it all the way, though. He actually took it to the last drop of blood. He took it to letting people beat him when he didn't have to let that happen. 
He took it to letting them nail him to a cross when he didn't have to let that happen. He took it, you know, took it to a new level, took it to a level we don't ever want to forget. In John 16, um, verses 2, and then I'll jump to verse 4, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour comes that whoever kills you will think that he offers a service to God. But I have said these things so that when their hour comes, you remember that I told them to you. So those are going to be some really, those were some trying times. There's still some trying times. But we do have this, you know, message from Jesus that told you this stuff was going to happen. So it is what it is. There, but the other stuff is true, too. We have a great future to look forward to. John 16 uh, verse 12 says, I still have many things to say to you, but you're not able to bear them now. But he gave those things to Paul, and Paul gave them to us. So um, we did get the more. John 16, 16 says, a little while, and you will see me no more. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And that um, that there's that encouragement that, you know, for them, they would have tied that to the future resurrection. Um, this is when I realize the emotion that I feel when I think of what I want to pray for when I eat and how it mirrors some of the emotion he felt at the Last Supper. Aside from the fact we should pray without ceasing, there is no specific instruction to pray before we eat. That said, I'm certainly not that good at continually praying, but it seems I seldom forget to eat. The biggest deal for me is what I get through Christ. I'm afraid I'm kind of selfish like that, but my head always goes there. A new body like his glorious body. Philippians 3.21 says, who will transform our lowly body so it will be in the same form as his glorious body. And the ability to ask directly of God in John 16, 26, and 7. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself treats you as friends, because you have befriended me and have be believed that I came from the Father. And then also Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petitions with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Interestingly enough, as I focus, focused on this topic, I found myself doing a better job of remembering to pray before I eat. So it was successful with that. And although the prayer at the beginning is really sweet at the beginning of this teaching, I'm more likely to pray something that includes something like this. Thank you, God, for this food. And thank you, Jesus, for giving up your body so that I will have a new body like yours someday. Thank you for giving your blood so that my sins are atoned for, and I can stand before the throne of God knowing that when he looks at me, he's seeing you. Now I'm seeing food as a reminder, and praying before I eat is one more opportunity to give glory to God. So that's what I wanted to share. <laughs>